Cool. So thank you for coming. Uh, this talk is about Live Home Safe, the good, the bad, the ugly. So let's get started. So we'll start with the usual who am I and some uh, introduction about the assignment, how this happens, some good impressions, bad imp impressions, ugly impressions, uh, and then some conclusion, and then we'll have some time for questions. So I'm Abraham Aranguren. I was already introduced, so there's, there's probably no uh, point in this. Maybe from here, uh, a long time ago, my employer paid for all the certifications, so you can see I took advantage of that here. So I was a developer first, then I switched to security, right? So if you're a developer or, or you are a pen tester, I got your back, right? So I know uh, both sides, like it has to be in production, working on Friday for developers, and I, why are you not fixing my vulnerabilities for pen testers, right? So I know like both uh, sides of the, uh, of the story. And then, yeah, if you're interested in this talk, just to say that there's a lot of public pen test reports on the website, so you just click on Service Security Command, you can click on any pen test report, you don't have to register anything, you can click on any of these pen test reports and you download the PDF. So today we will be talking about this one, Leave Home Safe, which was published uh, last year. This is a COVID-19 contact tracing app uh, enforced in Hong Kong, so I'll be talking about this today, but just to mention that if you're interested in this type of stuff, uh, this year, we published a few more um, pen test reports that are also related to, they have some component related to mobile, right? So in this case, this, there's other stuff in there, but just to mention that. And there's a bunch of other uh, pen test reports. So this was a kind of similar app mandated in South Korea. So by law, every parent and child was forced to uh, install the app. So um, it was so bad that we even gave a talk about it, right? So if you search on YouTube for Smart Shave Dumb Idea, you can see a talk about that. And another one for the Chinese police uh, and cloud pets apps. You can search for Chinese police and cloud pets, and there's another one in there. And basically, this talk and these other talks about Chinese government type apps is why I will never go to see the Great Wall of China and stuff like that. So. <laughs> Uh, so, okay, so let's give a quick introduction uh, about this. I think the best, uh, let me see if this works, uh, would be to do it like this. I, let's see if it works. So that's a, a quick introduction, right? And now let's do the official uh, news introduction about what's going on in uh, Hong Kong by a news agency there. Reviews of the Leave Home say that to enter eateries and entertainment venues has not been fully welcomed. Some residents said they will stop going to the cinema because of privacy concerns, while restaurant owners may switch to takeaways when the measure is enforced in two weeks. Emily reports. It's become almost a reflex action, scanning the leave home safe code on entry to many venues. <coughs> this woman said she's got used to it because working in a public swimming pool requires her to do it every day. Currently, there's still the option of filling a paper form, but that will be gone in two weeks' time. Starting on December 9th, the contact tracing app becomes a must for all premises regulated under the Prevention and Control of Disease Regulation. Why isn't the Leave Home Safe app made compulsory for the MTR and buses then? This man asked, noting that they are usually crowded. He said he may stop going to the cinema due to privacy concerns. Also affected under the new mandate are eateries, like this Type A restaurant, which is not required to collect any customer's records at the moment. The manager said it serves a lot of elderly people and school children who don't have smartphones, adding it may change course to do more takeaways or catering services. The new measure comes into force as Hong Kong tries to persuade the mainland to resume quarantine-free travel. Another plus for the city is that it has finally reached its vaccination target, with 70% of the population having received at least one dose. Oddly, HKIBC. The mandatory use of the leave. 
So yeah, basically uh, we are talking about a COVID-19 uh, contact tracing application. Uh, and yeah, the main problem is because the Chinese government is kind of taking over Hong Kong now. Uh, is the Chinese government using this to spy on people, right? So this is the YouTube video in case someone is uh, seeing the slides after the talk, they can click on it. This is the video I played. And basically in the first time, you could upload uh, visit records, right? So this is version one of the app, version two of the app. You can upload the uh, electronic uh, vaccination records. And then version three, you can connect to the Hong Kong health code system, which is basically the health system <clears throat> that they have in there. And we'll have a nice vulnerability uh, about that. So, so yeah, in, in November 2020s, when the government introduced this, initially the adoption was very limited, uh, very few downloads compared to the population. So, of course, the people in Hong Kong, Hong Kong uh, was a UK colony, right? So they basically had like uh, Western uh, type rights uh, until very recently, as it's only now that the Chinese are taking over that the whole uh, wall of China and the Great Firewall of China and everything else is kind of um, approaching on them, right? So they, there's, of course, privacy concerns and some people obtain secondary mobile devices uh, to keep sensitive content separate and not using their real names and stuff like that, right? So initial uh, leave home safe concerns about excessive permissions. Uh, so this is uh, some of the concerns on the initial releases. So they reduced the number of permissions from 15 to 7. Uh, there was some privacy statement about asserting compliance with the personal data ordinance. Then in February 2021, uh, they, um, they started to tighten this up, right? So like, you had like to scan this like in more places. Then um, the policy evolved due to Chinese government encouragement aiming to reduce second phone use, establish real name registration, right? So they're trying to get rid of all these privacy workarounds that people were doing and then in November 2021 the government mandated app used for entry into, into various public venues right so you had to scan the code anywhere so in theory it wasn't mandated but in practice if you want to live in Hong Kong you had to like scan this anywhere right so if you went to the gym to the church to uh, the underground to a restaurant whatever uh, if you want to uh, get out of your uh, house and, and go somewhere you had to like scan this somewhere right so so yeah uh, and then, yeah, then violations, face fines, uh, non-compliant restaurants were downgraded. Uh, so this led to a substantial increase in app downloads, uh, reaching over 8 million. Uh, and then there's like suspicions of artificial inflation. But anyway, uh, people were kind of forced to use it. So um, there was uh, more people using it, basically. Uh, and then the government attempted to address the privacy concerns with public statements and so on. So you can see a bit of the history here. Then in May 2022, Fagwire revealed facial recognition capabilities. So this got everybody a little bit freaked out. We also looked at this. Um, I can I have the Pentest report open, so I can uh, talk about this at the end if I have time. Um, and yeah, there were like some uh, additional privacy and social uh, controls, uh, social concerns about this, right? So, what are the concerns with this? So personal data security. Uh, all these contact tracing, right? Uh, they, they are like having ac have access to like user information. They can be misused, um, and so on, right? So how how is the data being used? Where it is being saved? Is the government uh, using these to spy on people? Uh, where is the data stored for how long, right? So all these are kind of not no. These are all questions that were really not known, right? Because there's no transparency uh, on the part of the government. The app is not open source or anything, right? So, so yeah, there's consent and transparency. Like users must be informed and provide consent before data processing, right? So this would be normal in the Western world, but but there not so much, right? Then third-party access, right? So some apps share data with third parties. So what happens with with that data being sent? Uh, and then the other. There's another challenge that I think they solved very well and I'll talk about in a second, which is that they uh, actually balance quite well the contact tracing effectiveness with the user privacy. This is quite a challenge, but they, I think um, this part of the application was actually not so bad. Uh, and yeah, that's part of the good that I'll be talking about uh, in a second. So, 
So this brings us to the audit, right? So the Hong Kong Democracy Council requested this audit. This was funded by the Open Technology Fund. And then we did this audit in April and May of 2022. The, the report is completely public, so you can just click on it and read it. Um, and then the project uh, attempted to address concerns about the potential security and privacy risks, right? So in Hong Kong, the context is that in Hong Kong, this COVID-19 contact tracing app was required in government venues, hospitals, markets, shopping malls, supermarkets, places of worship, and a lot more, right? So that's the basic uh, background. Now, we had some uh, problems. Now, thankfully, unlike uh, with the Smart Sheriff app that we did for South Korea, which was only in Korean, at least in Hong Kong, English is kind of a, <laughs> an official language, so we didn't have uh, the problem of having to translate the app from Chinese, so that part was good. But we didn't have access to user data, we had no documentation, no source code. In fact, we had to ask like, some people in Hong Kong to help us with like, some like, real codes and stuff to be able to test certain things. But we didn't have Hong Kong health code system credentials, we didn't have a valid uh, COVID-19 vaccination status, uh, QR codes, and no valid COVID testing uh, status QR codes, right? That were required by the app. So there were some limitations in our test because of this, but still uh, we managed to find like a bunch of problems. So, so yeah, it was mostly the combination reverse uh, engineering and runtime analysis to do both a security audit and a privacy audit, right? So the privacy audit I'm leaving it more to the end because I don't know if I'll have time for everything. So let's first talk about uh, the good, right? So the good, uh, while the results were really bad compared to a standard banking application, for example, there were a few positive things that I'll talk about. Uh, the bad is that for being a mobile app, like in mobile security assessments, it's really rare to have a high or a critical severity vulnerability nowadays. Like most of the time, the, uh, when we do a pen test report, it's normally everything is medium because it requires at least to have like a malicious app on the same device or something like that. So that lowers the impact a lot. Uh, but in this case, we had two highs and one critical, which is really bad. It, it's like, like unheard of pretty much, like the worst uh, app pen test that we did in the entire year, uh, to be honest. So, so yeah, it's really impressive, especially for something that they spend like 7 million or something like that on. Uh, and then the, the ugly was the disclosure process, right? So during the disclosure, I'll talk a bit more about this at the end, but uh, the journalists, they don't seem to understand that the bullshit that a politician says has absolutely no weight compared to a pen test report with proof, right? A pen test report with proof is evidence. Uh, some bullshit that someone says is not evidence, is bullshit. <laughs> so. Uh, the journalists seem to have uh, trouble to understand this difference, so I'll uh, rant a little bit about that afterwards. And then the Hong Kong government, they try to, to uh, downplay the report saying it's inaccurate, but then they silently patched some of the issues, right? So first they said that the report is inaccurate, but then after like a month or something after the pen test, they started patching some things without saying anything to anybody, right? Uh, so yeah, uh, anyway, so let's start with the good, right? So. Uh, the Android and iOS apps, they securely protected sensitive data. We didn't find any leaks in logs or, or encrypted, uh, unencrypted files. They did not leak Hong Kong health code system credentials in HTTP caching artifacts, which uh, by default in a lot of iOS apps especially, this is actually quite common. So they were doing this, uh, this right, which was uh, somewhat surprising. Uh, the Android app disabled backups, disabled clear text HTTP, which sometimes we see developers do the opposite, right? So since Android 9 and iOS 9, clear text HTTP is blocked by default in both Android and iOS, but sometimes developers enable it, <laughs> so they, uh, they weaken the platform default. But in this case, they did the opposite, right? So this was good. They were disabling clear text HTTP, so even though they were supporting old Android versions, even in those versions, it would be disabled. And the same for iOS, right? So they implemented no ATS exceptions, so this means no clear text HTTP leaks in iOS, and also no custom URL schemes, so this means no URL hijack impossible in iOS. So these were some of the, of the positives, right? Also, the hard-coded Google API keys were properly restricted, right? So there's a setting that you can configure so that random people cannot uh, burn your budget with uh, your Google API keys, so they were doing that right. Um, and then Android and iOS, they were effectively securing the application secrets. They were using the Android Keystore and the iOS Keychain, which is actually, believe it or not, 
somewhat still rare for a lot of applications. They are still not using the key store and the keychain. So let me explain this a little bit. So Android and iOS, they have these hardware back security enclaves where you are supposed to store your secrets, right? So these are hardware back. They are protected even against a physical attacker with physical access to the device. And this is the place where developers should be storing their secrets. Most of the time, uh, the applications, uh, although the developers don't know about this and they store secrets in preference files and, and other wrong places like that. But this would be the appropriate locations to do that. And actually, they were doing this right, right? So uh, credit where credit's due. At least this was done correctly. And then another um, interesting thing is that they were encrypting everything, even in the key store and the keychain. There, a lot of things were encrypted, but also in the file system, they tended to encrypt uh, everything as well. So that was also good. And then this was really impressive, right? So because with COVID contact tracing, you need to be the promise of the app is if you've been in contact with someone infected by COVID, you will be alerted, right? So by definition, uh, this is kind of they need to know who you are, who was infected to alert you, right? So it's kind of difficult to balance privacy with uh, with this kind of functionality, but they they achieved it in a very clever way, right? So they were using the Firebase device registration, so it's Firebase and not them who has the device registration, and then this balances really well the COVID-19 contact tracing with the user privacy because. It's not the Hong Kong government that has like who is infected by COVID and who was closed. It's kind of all being figured out through the device registration, even without any PII, right? So this was pretty cool. Um, actually, uh, this was a uh, positive, right? So this is part of the good. So now let's start with the bad, right? Well, let's start. Let's start like uh, with the uh, you know low hanging fruits, like the easy ones, right? So leaks through a missing security screen on Android and iOS, right? So this was low. But you know, let's start like with the easy stuff. So normally, most banking apps will have some security screen, right? So in Android and iOS, when you background an application, by default, the platform takes a screenshot to um, give the impression that the operating system is faster than what it really is, right? Uh, so it shows whatever the application was rendering at the last time. And the problem with that is like sometimes depending on what the app does. In this case, this app could show if you are infected by COVID, for example, or it could show like your Hong Kong health code system credentials, depending on the screen you were on. Um, this could be bad, right? Because anybody with access to an unlocked device, and now you could think, well, you need access to an unlocked device, but you can grab a device and put it in the face of someone and it will be unlocked, right? Or, or, or take the finger or something like that, right? So it's not uh, as far-fetched. And, and the problem with that is like you could see like if someone is infected by COVID or not, which is considered uh, sensitive information, right? So this could be attackers with physical access, but also like malicious apps could uh, in some cases be able to see stuff like that, right? So you can see sensitive user data, visit records, Hong Kong health code system credentials, and other uh, information. So you navigate to some sensitive screen to replicate this issue, then you send the application to the background. So this will make Android and iOS take the screenshot. Uh, and then you show the open apps and observe the text input from the sensitive screen. Uh, and it's interesting to note that this remains readable even after a device reboot, right? So uh, you reboot the device, and as long as the user has access to the unlocked device, the screenshot will be visible, right? So these are some of the examples. You could see like the user credentials. If this was the last thing rendered, this is uh, Android and iOS. Uh, you could also see the report infection, right? So when you report to the Hong Kong government that you are infected by COVID with your case number and your name and so on uh, in Android and iOS. Um, the visit record, right? So this is the, the places where you've been. So you could also, uh, this could also be leaked through screenshots as well as the whole list of places where you've been uh, could also be leaked through uh, screenshots, right? So. So yeah, this is kind of uh, one of the basics, right? So it's not like super scary. You will only leak the last thing being rendered by app, but still not, uh, not uh, at the same level as a normal banking app, and especially not for something that millions of people have to use in a country, right? Now, this one happens like in a lot of mobile pen tests. Um, task hijacking is normally like 
not tested for by many companies and it happens like a lot of times right it's an attack relevant especially to uh, android versions below and uh, up to android 9 and the way it works is that uh, a malicious app on the same device can spoof the task manager right so you can inject the app uh, as another app and then if you click on the task manager or you click on the other app then the attacker app could be shown so the trick is you can uh, you can use this for phishing, right? So if your app can show a screen that is very similar to the legitimate application, the user will have no way to tell. So you could, for example, have a fake um, login screen and capture credentials, right? So that's a one possible uh, attack vector. And actually, a lot of bank uh, app trojans have used this technique uh, in the past, right? So, so yeah, we found like the Android app was susceptible to this uh, with Stranghog and all the techniques documented since 2015. Uh, and then this is kind of the normal way to do this to with Stranghog is with task affinity manipulation, single task mode and task reparenting, right? So I'll show this in a second. So you can actually see this type of vulnerability just looking at the Android manifest. So if you open the Android manifest, and then uh, you see that this single task uh, as, the, um, as the launch mode of the activity, of the launcher activity, then this, will, uh, this is already pointing to the possibility of task hijacking. And then the other thing that you need is that the um, um, task affinity is not blank, right? So I'll show, uh, I'll show that in the fix, in the proposed fix in a second. So let's do a demo of this, and then it will make more sense. So this is the task hijacking. So you click first on the app, and then this is like the app showing some stuff. You can see the app is in the task manager. Then you clicked on the attacker app, and you see after clicking on the attacker app, if you click on the victim app, it's, it's, render, it's opening the attacker app, right? So let's do that again. You click on the attacker app, and then when you click on the legitimate app, the attacker app opens, right? So if the attacker app shows a fake login screen, the user has no way to tell if you make it identical to the victim app, right? So that's the idea of this attack. Now, this is only medium because it requires an attacker app to be installed, right? Even though the impact could be very high if you stole the credentials, but still having an attacker controlled app, uh, it's kind of a big requirement, right? So that's why it's only medium. Okay, so let's see what else we have here. So this is the way to fix this type of attack, right? Now, task hijacking, this happens in a lot of Android apps. We have this in almost every pen test. So if you have mobile app developers, tell them about this. Uh, the best way to fix this is in the application tag of the Android manifest to set the Android task affinity to an empty string. And then uh, in the task, uh, task hijacking exploit, there'll be no task affinity to exploit because um, Android will generate a, a, a random one, right? Which will be different per device. So, so this will basically kill the attack uh, by itself. Uh, it's also better if you make the launch mode a single instance, uh, especially for the launcher activity. But if you do the Android task affinity set to a blank string on the application uh, tag of the Android manifest, this will actually protect uh, all the activities, right? Regardless of which is the launcher. So this is why this is like the best way uh, to fix this type of, of issue. OK, so now let's get into more interesting stuff. COVID uh, status access through unsafe SD card usage, right? So. This was affecting the Android application. So the Leave Home Safe Android app stores uh, COVID vaccination and COVID test status images in the SD card, right? So this happened when the user attempts to, for example, import QR codes from safer locations like Google Drive. So this is concerning because the SD card in general is an inappropriate location for sensitive data. Uh, example one, you leave your phone on a taxi, right? happens all the time. Some people drop the phone in a toilet too, right? So uh, anything can happen. So uh, someone, even uh, without any like magical uh, elite skills, right? So unskilled thief can extract the SD card, plug it into a computer and read anything on the SD card, right? So this doesn't require any elite skills, like anybody can do this, right? So this is one big reason 
why you should never have like sensitive stuff on the SD card in Android. Especially, a lot of Android devices have SD cards that can be extracted. So uh, you just extract the card. You don't need <laughs> to know the pin or the analog pattern. You just extract the card physically, plug it into a computer, read anything, right? So. This is why uh, this is uh, bad. And then the other example would be a malicious app, right? So any malicious app that has SD card access will have access to uh, read or modify anything stored in the SD card, including whatever the application installs in there, right? So this is why uh, this is bad and why you shouldn't uh, do this, right? So this is the example of the app, right? So the navigation to the electronic vaccination testing import. Uh, you can see here, uh, the place were to, to import this, and then there's like a, a scan of the code, and then there's an option, I think it was here, the import option. Uh, so if you click on the import option, and then you would try to import the code from Google Drive, which would be a safer location because it requires uh, authentication. Uh, and then this was one of the codes that we used uh, for testing, and then you can verify this from, from the command line as well. You can ADB shell of the SD card, you can see the file name uh, from there, and then you can just pull it, right? So ADB pool of the path that you know from the previous command. And yeah, you can just download it like that. You could even like enable USB debugging if you had access to a, uh, to a phone that when you couldn't extract the card, you could also like do it this way, right? So how to fix this would be to uh, avoid using the SD card for storing sensitive data. Images, uh, sensitive images should be stored in the internal storage of the application. So on the data data directory is where Android can enforce permissions. So this would be a much better place. And if necessary, you can use a file provider to grant access to relevant apps like the Android camera. So there's functionality in Android that you can implement where you could still use this directory with Android protecting the permissions and then a file provider to grant access only to a specific app like the Android camera to be able to save uh, the file in there, right? Um, and then other possibilities would be to consider encrypting or promptly deleting uh, used SD card QR codes. Uh, but if you delete stuff, even shredding may not entirely erase the files on flash storage, right? Because flash works in a slightly different way than traditional hard drives. But it will still uh, reduce the forensic recovery chances, right? So. This would be like suboptimal uh, approaches, but in, in case you really need to use the SD card, it's something that could be uh, considered. Now, uh, let's get into uh, the funny one, right? So COVID status access through auth bypass, right? So this was really interesting. So the app had, and I'll tell you how, how they fixed it afterwards, which is really funny. So. Uh, the Live Home Safe Android and iOS apps have a feature to enable authentication to access COVID uh, vaccination and test results, right? So there's a pin of fingerprint required for access, and this feature can be trivially bypassed due to a logic flaw, a logic flaw that even your grandmother can do, right? So let's see it. So a malicious attacker with access to an unlocked device could gain access to the user COVID vaccination and COVID test status. How? Through simple screen tapping. Minimal effort and skill required. Uh, currently, the security control offers no protection. Issue confirmed in both Android and iOS. So let's see it, right? So you navigate to the app setting, settings. You enable authentication. You verify that the fingerprint or PIN appears uh, to be required when accessing the COVID vaccination results. And the steps are the same for Android. So this attack work on both uh, Android and iOS. So this is an example from iOS, right? So you enable authentication. And then when you try to see the, the COVID uh, status, right? You tap on that and then it says uh, that Touch ID is required, right? So enable authentication on iOS requires Touch ID to access COVID status data. Same on Android, right? So you enable this and then you have like the fingerprint prompt on Android, like uh, you're required to use the fingerprint, right? So that's the, the, in theory how it's supposed to work. You could uh, restart the device and open the app again if you really want to. Uh, to verify the intended restrictions uh, on iOS, that is still required, the same on, uh, on Android. But then if you disable uh, authentication, then you have access, right? So, so this attack is like you, you try to open it and it says the Touch ID is required, but you just go into the settings and then you disable it and then you can access it, <laughs> right? So, so it's like, come on, 
right? Uh, and the same on Android, right? So it says like you have to enter uh, this, right? You have to enter the fingerprint, but then you disable it, and then you can you can access it, right? So this is like a logic flaw. Uh, it's like, come on, right? Do you guys spend like seven million on this? Uh, and yeah, let's uh, let's uh, do a demo of this. So. So this is the uh, the application. So you go into the settings, you enable uh, authentication, right? And then when you go into the screen to see the, the vaccination and testing record, it says like touch ID is required. So you can like close the app, open it again, uh, and so on, right? And then eventually when um, when you disable it, you can see that it's bypassed, right? So now it's required because this is being enabled. This about closing and opening it is just to completely rule out any sort of caching problem, right? So you can see that touch ID is required, okay? And then you go into the settings and app settings, and then you disable the authentication for the electronic testing, uh, the vaccination uh, record. And then when you go into that screen, you tap on it and you have access, right? So it's like, it's like, come on guys. So, so yeah, you can tell the testing was not very thorough, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, but it gets better, right? So you would think, well, okay, let's finish this. So. What, how to fix this, right? So in this case, what they should do is whenever you enable uh, or disable the authentication, you should require the fingerprint again, right? So if it was ena enabled to disable it, you should require the user to enter the fingerprint again, right? So on this screen, when you disable it, they should prompt you again for the fingerprint and then it would be disabled, right? That would be like the proper way to do it. But they didn't have that check, right? So you could like disable it and then you had access. So, so yeah, that will be like the, the proper way to do it. Uh, and then this feature should ideally protect the entire application, including the visit record, the Hong Kong health code system and other stuff, right? So, so that will be the proper way to do it. But do you know how, how they fixed it? Any guesses? Did they remove it? Exactly. <laughs> they removed the feature. They left everything wide open. So that's, the, that's how they fixed it. They removed the feature. So uh, yeah, no possibility to even lock the the you know the the COVID uh, the COVID uh, record, right? But it gets better, right? So this is one of those attacks that in a mobile pen test the the test team always tries and never works nowadays. Like nowadays, it's kind of really rare for this type of stuff to happen. But in this test, it happened, right? So this this uh, says something as well. So money in the middle without warnings through invalid TLS certificates. So, so yeah, really uh, impressive that they made this kind of mistake. So, so let's see a breakdown, and then I'll also speculate a little bit of why I think this happened. So, so yeah, this uh, this was a problem in the TLS certificate validation, risking money in the middle attacks without warnings uh, in an app that again is used by millions of people that are forced to use the app, right? So a malicious attacker with a valid domain on the internet, right? So not a big requirement. You just have a domain on the internet. And then with uh, something like Let's Encrypt, you have your TLS certificate for free, right? So uh, not a big attack requirement. And then able to manipulate network communications. So we're talking public Wi-Fi without guest isolation. Another relatively low effort attack for an average attacker would be DNS rebinding and then more high profile attackers. Now, again, the Chinese are kind of behind this. So uh, BGP hijacking and ISP man in the middle, this would be more kind of higher uh, attacker profile, right? But this would all be possibilities to, to manipulate network communications. And in essence, you could intercept traffic without warnings between the Leave Home Safe application and its backend server. So it's kind of a serious problem. And you'll see why when you see the screenshots. So for example, an attacker could intercept the login to the Hong Kong health code, code system. So that sounds kind of serious. <laughs> Gain access to the Hong Kong identity card and password of the user. Obtain the personal one-time password provided by the Hong Kong Center for Health Protection, right? So you can get uh, also like the second factor, the, the one-time password. And intercept user reported COVID infections, right? So, so yeah, pretty bad. 
so let's see let's see how uh, this happened right so to replicate this issue now again this uh, is something that you can do if you are testing for this type of stuff so in the you can go to the android settings the proxy settings and then you update it to use your bird proxy for example and then you set it to trust ca sign certificates right so this is kind of a setting that most pen testers will have but then the trick is uh, in the proxy server you have to use uh, always a, a wrong host name right so a host name that is not like the valid host name for the victim host right so uh, in this case we use a proxy um a certificate for valid for security.com regardless of the inbound host header right so in burp Okay, I'll have a screenshot in a second. In Burp, I'll show you how in, in a second. So this simulates a malicious attacker able to supply a valid certificate uh, for a given domain to TLS clients, right? So this configuration is invalid, should result in security warnings for any TLS connection attempt, and warnings should occur for any host that is not serving security.com or any host that you use, right? So this is how to test for this type of stuff in Burp. So you just go to certificate, and then there's a setting generate ca sign certificate with a specific host name right so you can use here whatever you want that is not like the legitimate server name right so proxy settings for a ca sign certificate with a host name of service coming this case and then you verify that the android browser shows security warning so this is an important check just to make sure we've said everything right it's not that the android device is trusting all certificate like you want to check that another app on the same device shows warnings, right? So this means that you've said everything correctly. Uh, and then uh, appropriate TLS validation should reject that, that certificate. So this was tested like this. So you can do ADB shell, Android Internet Action view of uh, some domain, right? So in this case, leave home safe something. And then you can see the Android browser says security warning. There are problems with the security certificate for this site. And then you have like, like this warning, right? So this is the way TLS validation is supposed to work, right? Because the SSL certificate is not valid for this domain. It's, it's not, the host name is not matching the host name verifier. And uh, we will see that when we see the vulnerable code, right? So after all this, we, can, we are finally ready to uh, confirm the complete lack of warnings in the Leave Home Safe app, right? So you open the Leave Home Safe application, try to log into the Hong Kong health code system, Use any randomly generated Hong Kong ID and random password. Uh, so this is the screen. You enter like your uh, Hong Kong stuff, right? And remember logging information or not, this doesn't really matter. And then you're logging. Uh, and then the, the request is captured like without any warnings <laughs> on the app, right? So this is the login request. You can see the dog number, the password, right? So you have like the Hong Kong ID and the password of the user. Uh, yeah, it's pretty bad. You, can, you also have, um, for when you report an infection, you have the infection report, but also like the second factor, like you can basically man in the middle everything without warnings. So, so yeah, this was uh, really bad. So no warnings appeared uh, after all those steps. You can like confirm like the interception on all this, of all this, right? And this is how the request looked like, the verify code, case number, uh, and so on. This is for the PIN verification. And, and this is the reason why it works, right? So they have a host name verifier. So in SSL, there's, there's two checks, right? So there's the normal uh, check of the certificate being signed by a certificate authority, right? But then there's another check, very important check, which is the host name verifier check, which is checking, it should be checking that the host name for which the certificate is, is matching the server that you are connecting to, right? So they had this checking here, right? So this is how they are verifying this hostname verifier. This is the verify function. And it says, if the string of the server I'm connecting to contains, which again contains, this is something I always in the security training, I'm always warning developers about this, right? So a lot of security bugs with contains, right? Normally it should be equal, uh, like from start to finish, this is the string that I want, or it should be like starts with or ends with but almost never contains, right? Because contains, there's like a lot of bypasses to this type of checks as well. But anyway, this is, this is not the case here. The case here is that uh, they're checking like, if the server I'm connecting to, is this very important server where people log into the health uh, system, right? So the health system of the entire country, then 
ignore the, uh, the skip, you know, the, the verification, right? So this is the return true here, right? And this is the actual validation. So it's basically saying, if the server I'm connecting to is this very important server that nobody should ever man in the middle, then skip validation, right? So that is what this is uh, doing in English, right? And it's like, come on, guys. This is probably, like, my suspicion is they probably enabled this for something they were testing in production, in development, and then when they released into production, they forgot about it, right? But again, now we've had, like, during LastCon, like, a lot of talks about scanning code and AI and all this, like, sophistication. Like, any scanner would be, like, screaming at this, right? Would be saying, like, don't do this critical, you know, like, SSL validation here, horrible. You know, there should be something, right? Uh, so this shows that they were not even doing any serious like code scanning, right? So because like, come on, this, this would never like pass, right? So how to fix this? Uh, improve the TLS validation. Now the OWASP spinning cheat sheet could also be used to uh, even improve like further the TLS validation, right? So with pinning, what you do is you pin the actual SSL certificate that you are connecting to. So this would protect TLS communications, even against like high profile attackers able to craft a certificate trusted by Android or iOS, right? So some companies like Trustwave can do this, uh, as well as a lot of countries. So this is also like a good practice, like to take things to the next level. But in this case, it was like uh, even like basic uh, SSL validation was uh, broken, right? Okay, so now let's talk about the ugly. <laughs> so. The ugly was the disclosure part, right? So uh, this is kind of the timeline. So this was the initial disclosure, email attaching the full pen test report. We received an automated acknowledgement. Like a few days later, another friendly disclosure reminder, like, hey, guys, this is going to be public. If you need help, we're here to help. If you have questions, if you need more time, automated acknowledgement received. Now another one. Automated acknowledgement received, another uh, this reminder, right? So this is kind of, <laughs> and then eventually there's like public disclosure. And then two days after the public disclosure, an official government response is issued. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, this is like the name of the organization in the Hong Kong government expressed deep regrets and strongly opposed to the inaccurate report and unfair accusation, right? So, so it's like, come on. Like we were telling you all the time, right? And then, uh, so this is on the 28th, right? So on the 29th, we actually retested all the high and critical findings and they hadn't fixed anything, right? So uh, we confirmed like Leave Home Safe 3.3.0 was released uh, 22 days before the report was shared, uh, strongly suggesting nothing was fixed. Uh, and, then, and then on this date, we further validate that the latest version remains vulnerable to at least the highest impact findings, right? So the highs and the critical were not fixed, right? So, so this is like, come on, guys. Now, these are some quotes from the media, right? So Hong Kong government has slammed a report by an overseas cybersecurity firm as inaccurate. After the company claimed the city's uh, leave home safe COVID-19 risk exposure app was vulnerable to data leaks uh, and phishing attacks, right? So this is one, one source. This is uh, another, actually, I think uh, this source was a little bit uh, better. But anyway, if they say like the office of the government chief information officer, which is responsible for the operation of the leave home safe app, hit back uh, at service security's inaccurate report and unfair allegation. Right, so they're basically trying to save face. <laughs> and then the Hong Kong government has rejected uh, an overseas cybersecurity firm's claim that flaws in the Leave Home Safe app could expose sensitive user information, saying there have been no security or privacy related incidents. And the, <laughs> like seriously, guys, and the report conducted by the company is inaccurate and unfair, right? So, uh, yeah. And then the, this is another one. You can see there's a bit more uh, Chinese influence on this one. How a US influence operation undermines Hong Kong's uh, COVID efforts with no expertise in public health or pandemic control, the irresponsible operation behind the US sponsored expose of leave home safe security flaws may well cost local lives. Like, come on, guys. So, yeah, that's uh, you know, a quick summary of the media. So, so yeah, this is the mini rant and conclusion. Like a pentest report serves as uh, concrete evidence, right? So you have proof. 
Now, most journalists clearly do not understand this and somehow consider random politician statements to carry equal weight, which is kind of, yeah. Uh, so this uh, underscores a notable deficiency in the realm of information security journalism. I think the same can be probably said about nutrition <laughs> and anything like scientific, right? Like people, like journalists normally just look at the abstract, you know, like most of them, right? I'm sure there's some good ones. So clearly, most journalists do not understand Penta's reports. Now, there's nothing against this, right? I have a fix in the next slide. But they often overlook the critical concept that a Penta's report containing tangible evidence necessitates validation by a third party source or similar authori authoritative entity, right? So that is, that is kind of the point, right? So if you're a journalist and you don't understand Penta's reports, hire an independent third party, able to download the app and verify the finding, and now, armed with the now double evidence, call out the politician bullshit, right? So that's kind of uh, the short of it, right? So, so yeah, uh, you know, imperative to recognize that there's a profound discrepancy between the credibility of random political statements compared to the compelling evidence of a Pentas report. So equaling the two is a misleading practice uh, for improved uh, discernment within the information security journalism, right? So. So that's the mini rant, and with that, uh, just uh, yeah, we have some time for questions. Maybe how how long do I have? Yeah. Okay, so then maybe I can show you before this the privacy stuff, which I wasn't sure I will have time for. So this um, because I mentioned before that there was some concerns about the face recognition. So so yeah, we found the face recognition too. So, whoops, mm, okay, I clicked on something there. Yeah, here. So we found the face recognition, but it seemed like we kind of found the same thing as this, as this Factwire article, which is that, yes, there was some face recognition. It was like um, Google face detector and React Native face detector, but uh, they didn't actually seem to use it, right? We couldn't validated at runtime that they were actively trying to recognize our face or anything like that, right? So it seemed more like an artifact, like they're using a library that has face recognition, but it didn't appear that they were actually using it, right? So, so that part of the privacy was not so bad. And yeah, maybe if I go to the index, so proven would be the ones in the privacy analysis proven would be the ones that would be like a biggest um, security or privacy concern, right? So fails to protect PII at rest and in transit. So you could see like in transit was the man in the middle without warnings. And then there's, um, yeah, weaknesses in transit and at rest. This was all kind of mentioned in the, the man in the middle and then the other uh, findings in there. Okay, so I think with that, maybe you have some questions. Now, another thing I wanted to mention is that we have a free pen test contest. <laughs> so, so you can get a pen test for free, uh, and then just sell other discount codes if uh, you're interested in something. And yeah, and any questions? Sure. May I send it? Who commissioned the report? Could you? OTF, the Open Technology Fund, um, is dedicated to internet freedom, and they sponsor these types of audits about freedom of speech. Uh, censorship. So a lot of the public reports that we have are not for commercial clients. They are they tend to be for um, from the Open Technology Fund and from OSTIF, which is like trying to secure open source. It's kind of a different uh, entity. But yeah, OTF is more dedicated to to internet freedom, uh, bypassing censorship. So from the public reports that I showed before, uh, for example, BridgeFi. This is the one that we published in January. This is for internet shutdown. So if, for example, Austin was like without any light, any internet access, then people would still be able to uh, talk to each other through Bluetooth. By using lip signal, it would encapsulate the messages through each other. So it's kind of providing internet access in a um, catastrophic uh, situation scenario. Then Argo VPN was also sponsored by OTF, and this was about Iranian citizens to have access to the internet. Uh, yeah, 
And then, yeah, the other one is was Ostiv, so it wouldn't apply for this type of stuff. The other one was uh, K9 Mail, which is going to be the new Thunderbird for Android, but that is Ostiv, so that, that is like to secure open source. But yeah, OTF tends to be like about that, right? So they are interested in internet freedom, access, uh, free access to the internet, uh, and yeah, try to, you know, <laughs> defend people from censorship and all that stuff. But in this case, it was also like a privacy audit, right? Because the concern was, are the Chinese using this to spy on people, right? So that was one of the main drivers of the audit. Yeah. Any other questions? Have you considered that even like it's possible, even if the journalists did understand the pen test report, they might still report the same way because of whatever influence, you know? Well, I understand, Try. I have a bias, but trying to be objective, I understand that if you have one side of the story through the Pentas report, you want to ask the other side to give like a impartial or kind of impartial view of it, right? But they should try to validate the findings, right? So you have to consider like a Pentas report is evidence, right? Now, if you don't understand it uh, as well, you can ask a third party like, hey, download the app, check this finding and tell me, is it true or not, right? So they could hire, now, of course, this costs money, right? So <laughs> maybe they don't have the resources, right? That's, that's another problem. But I think if they did that, they wouldn't give the same weight to the government because then it would be clear that what the government is saying is bullshit. Like I, if I show you <laughs> this, this thing here with the, uh, this is like the decompiled Android code. Like anybody can get the APK, decompile it, and see this code. If you put this into MobSF, it will scream at you. It will say critical, uh, SSL, any automated tool that is checking this will, will scream at you and say this is wrong. So it's not like uh, magic science, right? So I think uh, if they validated their results with some third party, uh, I think it would, you know, be a different result for sure. Because they gave, like, if you look at the quotes, right? The saying like the Hong Kong government has slammed. They haven't slammed anything. They, they, they have said some bullshit. They haven't proven, they haven't proven uh, wrong the report. They have like absolutely nothing, right? If they validated it and didn't tell you they validated it, they would still report the same way because they have incentive to, you know. Yeah, there could be, there could be something going on like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, my other question is, uh, maybe due to the notoriety of being called out, uh, did you know? Do you guys see any kind of uh, rise in business of other pen test reports to your objectivity? Uh, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I haven't measured this scientifically or anything, so I don't have that <laughs> that data. Are you planning to go to China soon? <laughs> no, no. Yeah, this is. I'm always asked this. Uh, yeah. I have a trajectory, right? Because there's, there's this one, and then there's the the one for the uh, Chinese police that we did as well. So yeah, the ones the, in the public pentas report that I showed at the beginning, right? So let me see if. Uh, so so these ones. So we did these three, right? So BXAQ is an app that they install when you cross the border into China. Right, so we did a pen test on that. iJob is when uh, the police officer kind of enters the data, so this app like got leaked and we looked at it. And then Study the Great Nation is like an app that rewards you the more that you know about the great leader of China, the more points you get. And then with these points, you can do cool stuff in China. So that's kind of what the app is about. So so yeah, we did like three reports, three, <laughs> three Pentas reports about stuff like that. And then there's like, the slides are public and I did a talk about it, like Chinese police and cloud pets. So yeah, I cannot go see the wall. <laughs> it will be, it will be kind of dangerous. <laughs> yeah, I'll see it. I'll see it from, I don't know, from uh, videos or something. <laughs> Why seven, eight? Um, uh, okay, in Spain, we have two surnames. So in my full name, the letter A appears seven times. So uh, a long time ago, I was looking for for a cool nick, and I said, oh, 7A looks kind of cool. The people were already calling me AAA in the company, so I said, well, why not? And then when I created the company, I said, well, 7A security, right? So 
it came easy, like <laughs> a potential company name. So that's the story. I didn't know if there was A's, I was missing. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the story. That's, that's how you scream when you see the reports. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, very good. <laughs> Any other questions? I got, I got one for you. We were sharing sure. the other day. Um, so how common in all your mobile pen testing, how common are some of those vulnerabilities? Some of those are more common than others. Yeah, very common. The, well, the, man in, the SSL man in the middle, not, not very common. But the task hijacking, this, if, if you don't get them with uh, Stranghog, you get them with Stranghog 2.0, right? Because it's, <laughs> it's one or the other, right? If you don't do the single task, then you have the single top. Uh, well, I don't remember like the details exactly, but if you don't like if you don't mitigate one, you you have like the other, right? So, yeah. So one or the other. This is like almost every pen test. I would say task hijacking all the time. The um, the two factor auth bypass that I showed is actually it comes up. I mean, not always. But it's not that rare. It's, uh, it, when there's that type of functionality, it tends to happen. Like the developers forget that you can go into the settings and disable it. So I would say medium occurrence. Um, yeah, and screenshot leak. This happens all the time. Yeah, this is. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's a little bit less severe. But yeah. So yeah, frequency-wise, I would say, and then. It's very common. They did this part right, the disabling of clear text HTTP. But normally we see the opposite. Like the developers enable uh, <laughs> clear, clear text HTTP in Android and iOS, which are no longer the defaults, right? So, so they weaken this. Uh, yeah, and then and then they also give you hints, right? So in iOS they tell ATS disabled for this domain, right? So you know what to look for in Burp like to do the man in the middle attack. And then sometimes there's some cool attacks, like they were in some pen test, I remember they were retrieving some zip file from an S3 bucket over clear text HTTP. So you could change the zip file. And then when you unzip it on the device, you can like overwrite anything you want, right? <laughs> yeah, so yeah, lots of uh, stuff like that. I don't know, that's from the top of my head, right? Not, not very scientific, but. <laughs> yeah, okay. Android or iPhone? Uh, well, the patch-wise, I tend to fall more for the iOS, right? Because like the you you get patches for much longer. Like normally in, in Android, like the most you get is like three years or something. But in iOS, I don't know. Like some people get patches like for seven or more years. So it depends on the type of person you are, right? So if you are going to change phone every year, then maybe Android is fine. But if you are the kind of guy that buys the best phone and then keeps it for five years or more, then maybe iOS is better. What do you care? Uh, iOS. <laughs> I'll give you another, another thought if I can on that, which yeah. is um, go look in the CWE database oh, and yeah, make I the did. choice. Yeah. You will discover there's more for iOS than Android. Yeah, that, that's, that is true. What about Google? Did the government come after you? Second. Did the Chinese government, I mean the Hong Kong government, come after you? No, not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> if, if they have, they are really good. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. So, do, you, do you have any sense of uh, if iOS and Android have the majority of the market share? Because, you know, there's probably other uh, mobile OSs uh, that maybe you didn't test, but I was just curious if like maybe 30% of Chinese citizens or Hong Kong citizens. Maybe. Oh, in, in Asia, it seems Android is much bigger. So yeah, and, and also like somehow there's problems with the SSL validation in Asia, right? So also with SmartShare, if we found like those SSL validation type of bugs, which in Western apps, is, they are very rare. Normally we almost never, it's something that testers always try, but never works. And with Asian applications, somehow they, they have like a trouble with, a, with SSL, right? So they tend to implement it less and they tend to use a lot more Android than iOS. iOS doesn't seem to be as big there. Yeah, I just didn't know if there was a larger market share of like a third OS besides iOS. And... The, the third OS some years ago was BlackBerry, but now it's like... <laughs> <laughs> like OnePlus, I think OnePlus used a different OS for a while. Well, yeah. 
it, it's still a trigoid. Yeah. The, uh, the difference might be whether a device has a place to water or not, but it's only broken. Any other questions? Or are we out of time? Okay. Thank you.